I'm Shalina Tobin, aka Posh Nosh Gal, and today I'm joined by the highly talented chef and restaurateur Andy Waugh. From humble beginnings in the beautiful Scottish Highlands, Andy's become iconic for his legendary award-winning meat and burgers at his restaurant chain Mac and Wild. His portfolio also includes innovative food and drink experiences, and from his butcher's outlets, he supplies some of the best produce available in the UK today. Hi Andy, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good, thank you. And how's how you? life been in lockdown? Uh, to be honest, it's been a slightly welcome change of pace, but... Um, uh, yeah, I've got two two young kids. So one of them's three. Iona, who's great and chatty. And another one, Angus, is eleven months. In fact, his birthday is next week, so he's gonna be one next week. But um, it's been nice to to be around them a lot more. Um, Angus took his first steps a few weeks ago. Oh, nice! That must um, be really nice to be around for it. Yeah, and, and I I definitely feel much more of a family unit. Um, so yeah, so it's good. Um, but obviously, the it's been a bit tough with um closing the restaurants and you know working out who we are what we stand for how we can have a, a viable business during this time and 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 um look after the future of of mac and wild and and our staff as well yeah so we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later on i just wanted to start at the beginning um with you so you grew up near inverness in scotland what was life like for you there um I mean, it was a. Uh, at the time, I didn't really appreciate it. I think, as 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 all kids do or don't, as the case may be. Um, but it was. It's a very different um, environment to 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 England, um, particularly. But there's just such a, a sparsely populated area. So we had a. My mom and dad live in this amazing old cottage. Uh, pretty knackered um on the side of this huge kind of it's called a kyle where's the where the river and the sea meets this massive expanse of water um and then behind us are hills and um yeah and, and nothing very much other than lots of deer and uh wildlife roaming around so so yeah our our kind of holidays always were in scotland my mom and dad uh love you know the outdoors and um and food particularly and, and fishing my dad is a massive keen fisherman so everything was everyone was kind of focused around fishing for stuff um so whether it was an island on the west coast or a or on this river spay or whatever it would be um we stayed in these amazing houses but yeah i, I just wanted to go to i wanted to go to france or tenerife just like everyone else um, but yeah so i think it was it was it was an amazing childhood and it's what i sort of want for my kids now now we were based in London, um, slightly different, uh, different, yeah, kind of experience for them. Yeah, and do you have a favourite childhood memory from back then? Was it fishing or? What a favourite, yeah, actually, one of my, this is a, my, uh, one, my first fish that I caught, I think I would have been about, I don't know, three years old or something. And we'd, I'd gone up, my dad was fishing on the river and I went up to visit him at the end of the day. I had a, a bamboo cane, so a cane of bamboo with a with tied some fishing line on the end, and um, and I sat there like a like a like a gnome, <laughs> just holding my my <laughs> thing. And um, I didn't catch anything, obviously. And, but he said, "Look, let's go back to the back to the house, and we'll just leave. We planted my rod into the, the side of the bank, and we we'll, we'll said we'll come back in the morning and see what it see what see what's on there." Right. And we came back in the morning, and lo and behold, there was a a, a huge trout, or a, I can't remember, maybe, maybe even a salmon on the end of it, like oh, completely wow. naked. It's obviously been there a while. And I I was absolutely chuffed. And from that day, I loved fishing. Like always, yeah, I've always loved it. And I love being outside and just that kind of the thrill of it. And um, But genuinely, this is about a, a year or two ago. So I'm 37. So two years ago, um, my dad had told me that he'd actually gone up in the morning, caught a fish, and then put it on the end of my line. <laughs> and, and I was, I'm, oh. and I, all of a sudden, I felt like, it's like, geez, my whole life was life focused has changed. On the story. <laughs> you never caught the fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there was that. Like, we used it. So, I, salmon is obviously a product that's synonymous with Scotland. But I grew up eating wild salmon caught from the river. 
and now they've got this different product that's farmed and much more fatty and but yeah we, we just we just ate really good foods our whole life it's amazing my mum's an amazing cook uh and we were all very keen eaters as kids yeah so you said somewhere that you ate meat for breakfast lunch and dinner is that right ah uh, well um yeah there was always always meat on the table um because we, we genuinely didn't have very much money um and yeah we sort of but we lived like gods like kings and um just in in the sense that our dinner table was always stacked and uh, our fridge was always full but um but yeah always because because venison was we, that's what my family do so they're game dealers so they they butcher wild meat and right. so we always had a, a fridge or a fridge full of full of venison or, or rabbits or pheasants or whatever the case may be right. um yeah it was just yeah it's a good it's a good source of, of protein it's healthy it's natural yeah. um it's what we should be eating yeah. So yeah, mum mom and dad were quite enthusiastic about us eating plenty. Yeah. So I'm six foot three, and my, brother, my brother's about the same size, so it's obviously helped for something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And along with fishing, did you also go hunting as well? Uh, yeah, I did a, did a bit, of, bit of that. Um, I was given a gun on my birthday, uh, my day of birth, uh, by... I mean, it makes me sound like an avid, like, shooting, hunting killer, but... Um, but no, like it's 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 not about that for me. It's not about going out and, and shooting hundreds of animals. Um, I I love to go out and and for me it's I, I would be happy not catching when you're fishing. It's not about catching the fish. It's not about shooting. It's just about being outside. Yeah. Um, and I just love being out on the hill or you know in the peace and quiet or with with nature. It's it's just good it's good for me. But uh, but yeah, we did a bit of shooting, um, like with, with deer or birds, and it was mostly rough shoots. So. Right. We'd go and just go out and shoot what we what we found, and then and then generally eat it or sell them to my dad for a couple of quid to buy some sweets or something like that. So. Oh, brilliant! <laughs> so so after after your childhood, you went to university. What did you study there? So I studied biology at Edinburgh Uni, um, and that was purely just because I had a very sciencey upbringing. My mum was the first forensic scientist, female forensic scientist in Scotland. Oh wow! So she, she kind of pushed that on to, to us kids a little bit and uh, and then yeah growing up in a boot well my fam family are butchers so growing up with these kind of um, carcasses hanging around we, we you soon get to understand how they work and and pull you know you can pull tendons and you see things move so I was just I was interested by it and so yeah I wanted to study biology Right, and um, well, that that's very different to to where you are now. So, what was it that brought you to London? Um, my girlfriend at the time um, got onto a, a master's at um, she doing broadcast journalism, so she was doing, she got a master's at um, uh, in Glasgow or uh, Westminster. So we decided, we looked at the, we the weather forecast and said, which one's got better weather, Glasgow? No. Um, but we just, uh, all, of our, all of our friends were, um, had moved to London and just thought, let's, let's have a change. So she, my not then girlfriend is now my, my wife and um, mother to my lovely kids. So um, yeah, it was a good choice. I'm glad that we did it. And, and yeah, instantly, uh, yeah, was was absolutely kind of charmed by the city and everything that goes on there and the food. I just remember walking down the soup, down the street and I think it was even like the Tesco and going to Tesco and being like, what the hell is this? What is this thing? And like all these weird and wonderful vegetables and the culture is just such a smash of, you know, of everyone. And yeah, I just was massively um, yeah, blown over by the whole vibe of the city and the food and the drink and people. Right, and so you set up a market stall called Wild Game Company. Uh, were you travelling back and forth to Scotland still? Um, no, I went, I did it a couple of times, but it's, a, it's about 12 or, I think if you drive door to door, it's 12 hours um, from London to my family place. So I did it a couple of times, just the fuel costs alone were not really worth it. Um, so I set up a kind of a, a network going um, from, from there down to London. Um, yeah. And so was, I mean, was that your initial plan to set up the market stall when you actually came into London? No, not at all. I, 
I always thought I would do something in 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 game and in venison and you know start my own business. I always had this kind of idea of that for some reason, just under you know at the back of my mind, and I didn't realize what it how to start it and until I I discovered I went on a cycle ride um, and just happened to bump into Broadway Market in, in East London. And yeah, again, I, I, I had a, had another kind of falling in love moment, and it just yeah, just sort of parked my bike, walked up through this market where you can you could buy a guitar, you could you could get a bike, um, you could buy amazing meat, you could get cheese, wine, and everyone there was so trendy and, and like just yeah, just it was just like a I was just like wow, what what is this? What is this yeah. place? Um, kind of epitomised that kind of London kind of vibe, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and I just, I just bumped into the organizers and I said, what, you know, what's the deal here? Can I have, can, can I start a stall? And they said, well, what do you do? And I had to make up on the spot. I had to just, you know, when you're, sometimes when you're forced to, to decide something and I just said, oh, I've got a, a, a game business. Um, and I obviously didn't, I had a family business that did it. So, and they, they said, okay, well, when can you start? We had a guy here who's, um, yeah, he's, he's gone. When can you start? And I said, well, I don't know, two, three, two weeks. <laughs> and um, so I quit my job on Monday and then went up, went back home, bought myself a van, uh, took, bought a few hundred quid's worth of meat off my dad and shot, shot back down to London. Wow. That, that, is, that is quite some story. <laughs> I wish it was a bit more. Do you know what? There, I mean, that, that, was, that was the... Um, the kind of shorthand version of it but there, there were a few moments when I, I'd been to other markets and I was it all started to make sense the whole what I wanted to do and I went to Borough Market and was really angry at the quality of food that was there right uh, or quality of game particularly and and because I remember being really homesick at, at the beginning when I'd arrived and I just saw that you know the the big banners that it says it said gay man something or other me and game or whatever it said and I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to go and have a talk with this guy. I'm going to talk meat. We're going to talk venison. We're going to talk whatever rabbits. And it's going to be, you know, it's going to be okay. And anyway, I walked up and I just saw this really mangy looking rabbit for about 10 pounds or something. And then all of a sudden, it's quite nice you touched upon the university. Like all, all my friends at uni had never t- tasted venison. Like they, they, a lot of them didn't know what it was. And I said, yeah, well, how can, you know, how can you not taste it? I've, and I, as you, again, you mentioned earlier, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we used to eat venison yeah so so that's where the kind of journey started i suppose at uni but then when i saw this product at borough i was just like wow that is that's what that's why people don't eat it and when they do eat it they think it tastes gamey or like like rich or whatever the terms that people have have are and i I was used to this you know succulent fresh you know nicely hung products and then i saw it and i went ah that is that's why no one buys it again that's why only people that yeah people that know about it buy it so yeah that those two kind of cup those two moments when i went to borough right and the broadway and i was like this is it this is what i've got to do, this is what you've got to do. and you and it was amazing because you um you had a fridge in your van or a freezer in your van where you bought all the meat back so i had a i had a serve over counter and so i bought a little refrigerator can- refrigerated counter it was one point I don't know if it was one and a half or 1.2 meters wide so I had to pick that and put it in the back of the van and I yeah I also bought myself a freezer a domestic freezer that fit in the back of the van and I used to use that I used to try and park it as close as I could to my house put in a a line going into my living room window so I'd freeze turn the freezer on and I have two liter bottles of ice um, or water two liter bottles of water and then freeze everything down for a couple of days and then I use that as my kind of working fridge. I mean, it's such a cowboy wow. thing to do, but it's just yeah, <laughs> it's what I did. Well, it's quite off innovative. Mind. Yeah, exactly. And, and like, I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't have the luxury of, of you know, any money behind me. And I didn't have uh, the kind of, yeah, the savings or anything to go and get myself a premises. So yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't want to pay, you know, whatever it would be like 50 or 100, 100 quid a week for a, for you know a, a storage or whatever so i just use my van yeah well it's a clever idea and um i mean in 2012 you were winning awards best street food trader and trader of the year that was amazing from where you've come to, to that 
Yeah, that was a really uh, special moment. It actually came up on my uh, Facebook kind of, whatever it's called, like time loop or feeder popped up the other day. Um, and it, yeah, it was a really, I'll always forget, I'll always remember that day and never forget it. Um, and I felt like such an underdog. I'm, I think we were making excuses. I was talking to my mate Rue, who, were, who were, uh, was running business with me at the time. And um, we were already making excuses when we went to this award ceremony and we're like, I think there was like four or five people in the, up for the award. And yeah, we were just joking about how, you know, I don't know, I can't remember. And then he said our name and I was like, no way, this is, this is hilarious. I think it was a Tuesday. And then we went out and got really drunk and said, don't worry, we don't need to go to the market tomorrow. And then I was like, we, we need to go to the markets. I can't wait to go to the market tomorrow. So we both had a stonking hangover, but, um, but yeah, it was a really that's fine time and that was that was the moment where i thought shit i need to do i need to do something with this this is there, there's more to what's going on people really are buying into it they appreciate the messages that we've got and, and the produce and so how did mac and wild come about so yeah so after i'd won the awards that you were just discussing the young british foodies yeah I was, I really wanted, I, and I had, I remember my first pop-up and I remember walking into the room and, and seeing people eating my family's, the venison that I'd bought from my dad's business sort of thing. And everyone was going, like, you know, when they, they don't actually say anything and there was 60 people in this pie and mash shop. And that was the moment where I, I, I really was like, I need, I need, this is what I want to do. Um, and I was trying to get a, trying to like get a restaurant. I had no idea on how to do that. I was just ringing up. Um, all sorts of people trying to get my foot in the door and there was huge deposits and uh, business plans and things that I just didn't really have um, and then I bumped into my old friend Callum um, Callum McKinnon so he was he just moved to London sold his uh, two or three two two or three um, bars and clubs and um, I, he was just asking what I was up to and I said well I'm trying to open a restaurant and he said oh that sounds cool do you want a hand? Um, so, so we sort of formulated the idea of Mac and Wild, and and it was you know the with with the kind of the dirty street food, and then some some sort of nice um, cuts of of steak and stuff like that. And uh, we 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 got it together, and we, we saved up managed to all all the money I'd saved up, and um, and a little bit of his cash to open a, our pop up on Charlotte Street. So that was our first kind of Mac and Wild pop up, and that let us demonstrate to landlords. You know, it was a full time restaurant. Uh, had I think I had about eighteen covers. Was it eighteen? Yeah. Um, well, it was. We, we, you know, we painted the walls and made it feel, yeah, kind of Mac and Wild esque, yeah. and we could demonstrate what we we're about. And it was, yeah, it was, a, it was a well, had lots of um, learning points, but uh, it was, a, it was a success. Yeah. So that was that was the first one. Hey. Oh, sorry. Go on. No, I was just gonna say that was that was two thousand and I think it was fifteen or four no fourteen we did that. that. 2014. Yeah, and then um uh your first yeah. and Mac and Wild opened in Fitzrovia in two thousand and fifteen and your second one came soon after in the city, but we'll talk more about that one later. <laughs> but you went from serving on a stall to having a big team of people. Did that require a new set of leadership skills? uh yeah i think it it required a new kind of approach to how how i spent my time where i spent my time um and really looking at what our core values were and what it is that we were trying to get across um yeah and dealing with you know how you had like 10 chefs and uh you know 50 i don't know what it, i can't remember what it was in the beginning but yeah dealing with all these people and, and making sure that they were happy and the produce was good and the reviews were great yeah it was it's a challenge and i i remember the there's so much focus goes on to into like when you open you know you're 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 at a date so we i think we opened on the 6th of or 5th of august uh, 2015 was the first official opening and there was so much focus on just getting the restaurant ready getting the team in getting the, everything you know getting everything prepared and and then I remember waking up on the on the sixth and being like, "Jesus, I've got to do this now. I've actually got to run." What? Well, I hadn't thought about this stage. I just just thought about getting getting opening. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So there's a there's a lot of learnings again. We've we've I've learned yeah how to do things the wrong way probably or how to do them right way but by doing them the wrong way. And we yeah. yeah that experience is definitely valuable now. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and so you have, uh, your signature dish is the Venimu burger, which is voted the best burger in Britain. Why is it so special? Um, God, well, you really put yourself on a pedestal when you say it's the best burger in Britain, don't you? Um, so... <laughs> Well, someone think, else put you on the pedestal, so... <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But, it. <laughs> uh, every, everyone's got their favourite burger, I suppose. But I, I mean, I love... Our venue is great. Um, there's, there's a couple of aspects. When, when you're making a good burger, you need some good flavour combinations, some good textures. Um, and I think the, the underlying kind of bonus we have above everyone else's are our... Um, provenance and and more so that we talk about there's actually a journalist dubbed us uh, they said they're more they more they have more than provenance it's extreme provenance right. um, so we talk about extreme provenance every now and again um and that i think that just lay, puts an extra layer of of sweetness into the pot products because we you know our venison comes from my family we can tell you the name of the the breed of deer um we tell you where where it's from we tell you the name of the hunter you can tell the name of the butchers online that day and 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 more so we, we can tell you about those people as well so we can you know we generally know where they where they drink where their kids go to school the name of their dog kind of thing um, so that yeah that that really helped but yeah that's i think it's a, it's, a, it's a there's a venison patty and a beef patty with some caramelized onions melted cheese bernays pickles um and a brioche bun like how, how wrong can you go <laughs> I mean, that's, that's delicious. well i'm actually gonna find out because i've got my own hey i've got my own kit and i've also got the brunch kit which <laughs> this this weekend is going to be full on so <laughs> i'm really looking well, forward to that and i got... see your um cloche the cloche video as well where where did that idea come from um god it's a bit of a slow kind of process over the years we, we we had a pretty crappy burger when we first started it was like just you know kind of standard patties that had all sorts of um uh, like flavors and and um and rusks and stuff into it so and it was just in it you know I can't, I can't remember it was a really basic burger but that we were sort of around when that burger revolution started heart start, kind of came on and um yeah just learning a few techniques from from other people and um yeah it's just it was it's just a nice way of steaming steaming the top of the bun so that's what the whole whole thing is important to me because the you get that when you put the water around and the and the cloche on top yeah. the steam goes in and, and warms the warms the lids and and more importantly melts the cheese so you get this like everything just sort of comes it's together Mm. I've never seen it before, so I'm going to be trying that this weekend. I'm, I'm not sure really I can take um, take full um, responsibility for inventing that. I think it's it's definitely a process that wasn't wasn't me that came up with, but um, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of people do it, and it's it's just a really good way of of making a, a really good burger. Right, right. And do you make your own haggis as well? Yeah. So, well, yes, we do, but uh, we don't make it commercially so we buy the haggis in um i i host haggis or used to when we were open um I host a haggis making class once a week so you come teach you all about what's in it how to make it but but making haggis is is quite a it's quite a, a, a serious process and for us to cause we, and we go through about 100 kilos of the stuff every week wow. um so yeah i i am i'm not willing to sit down and and make 100 kilos of haggis every every week um so we we buy it from my local butcher up in the north of scotland from monroe's the butcher who are, who are one of the award-winning haggis makers but yeah i can teach you how to make it <laughs> it's all right i get a bit squirmish i just like eating i, I don't really i'm not into making making that kind of stuff <laughs> well it's, it's important it's not about it's not about being disgusting or or gross so the whole underlying message behind Macamod is that is, is trying to like get that sense of reality and yeah. um and yeah and, and there is the the only difference between eating a liver heart and lungs versus eating a fillet steak or a ribeye it, it, it's it's protein it comes from an animal that it's probably a muscle that has a purpose like or an organ it, it, there's there's very little difference it's purely cultural and we seem to have kind of moved away from what the reality of, of eating meat and, and I just I think it's wrong and in the time we live it's such a good time now because it's people are 
um, don't want to waste anything and they don't want to like just throw away half an animal for or yeah most of the animal like no one wants anything other than the the ribeye the fillet the sirloin mm. maybe the the rump the rest of it like just put it in the bin so it doesn't it doesn't work like that we've got to respect the respect the animal and 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 the planet so so haggis haggis will save the planet well I'm convinced, so I'm going to come for one of your classes now. I'd love to have you there. That'd be great. <laughs> so in 2018, you went full circle and you returned to your roots with the Mutton Wild Base Camp. Tell us about that. Uh, so Falls of Shin, um, that is about six miles from where I grew up. There was always a cafe kind of restaurant offering there. Um, it's basically uh in the middle of a forest along a single track road so if you're driving one way and another person's coming the other way one of you has to reverse to a passing place and let them pass and then you drive on right. and it goes the road sort of shimmies up the side of this river and it's a famous famous salmon river for for fishing um and people people pay lots of money to go fishing there and then halfway up the river there is a there's a waterfall huge big waterfall so it's this big kind of point where the poor salmon have to yeah make a, a leap of faith and swim up there somehow and, and we're just lucky just the way that the geography is and there's a a great um uh viewing platform for the for you to watch the salmon leaping up so anyway the, beside there there's a clearing in the in the forest and they've, they've built this well recently rebuilt the um the restaurant because it, it burned down about five or no maybe more six seven years ago um, and the community bought it and and did it and um, and opened it back up, but sadly, um, yeah, sadly when it burned down, there was a lot of you know a lot of people employed there. So the, the community bought it as a as a way of sort of just yeah having a facility because there's not a lot there. So so the location's beautiful. I've seen images on of it. Um, and was it a conscious decision to go there? Um, I guess I guess my heart has has always been pining to go back to, to the Highlands and there's um there's a really famous uh, Burns poet Robert Burns who's our famous poet from Scotland and he, there's a poem that says my heart is in the Highlands my heart is not here and I, I kind of always feel like that I mean I, I did recent well less recently now I've got my kids and stuff down here um but yeah I, I mean the Highlands is always going to be my home and yeah I, I, it, it's, where, it's where my soul kind of wants to rest i suppose but um it's really nice to to gone back and and try something up there and um it's been a really tough business exercise to to try and uh, it was maybe a bit arrogant or or like yeah just inexperienced shall we say um that i thought i could just take back and wild from from london and put it into this place in the islands and it's just it doesn't it's not worked like that it's been a different kind of customer base and right. um yeah, it's a different offering that was needed. So, so we've had to change things up a fair bit, but, but the fundamentals are still the same. You know, it's about good produce um, sourced very, like very locally there, which is quite easy for us to do. Mm -hmm. um, but we've also pivoted into this kind of, uh, so we do, um, we've got the a kind of cafe offering where we do you know, teas, cakes, coffees, and, and like sausage rolls and sort of Mac and Wild classics. Um, and then we've got this fire pit feast supper club that we have um every now and again so it's like kind of seven courses five to seven courses cooked on the cooked on the open flames wow big communal table um and and i, t I kind of i've found myself like my, my style and everything of cooking and has really come out there and it, it it kind of reflects everything that i love so we have big you know boards of salmon or mackerel or whatever fish we've we've got kind of sitting against the fire and well, big cuts of beef and maybe a you know pot of langoustine simmering away and and vegetables and it's for for me I just absolutely love cooking like that because it's it's so raw um you've got smoke in your face half the time which is not so fun but um but the customer can see what they're eating and and it's and it kind of it's not that yeah they're not just celebrating the a, a sexy piece of you know a tiny bit of, of fish or meat with a you know some sort of trendy foam and some powder on top they see it all before it gets to that stage so they see and you're like ah oh, right that's what i'm eating and that's that's the reality of it right. um, it's, it's a really fun communal space so we do that, that that kind of fire pit feast and we've got some adventure accommodation in there as well so um yeah we've got some land rovers with 
the tents and we're just looking at um, putting some um, yeah, really amazing stuff into the forest that surrounds us. So, um, yeah. Well, that sounds um, like an amazing experience. Mm, it's a really special place. So definitely yeah. recommend people to go there. There are many elements to the business, including supper clubs, foraging classes, whiskey master classes. Are you a blend or a sort single malt whiskey drinker? So I would... Um, I would never try and pigeonhole myself as one or the other. Um, just because, I mean, a single malt is just a blend of whiskey made from the same place. It doesn't, doesn't mean, mean anything. Uh, I do tend to drink probably more single malts, but that's just because I've got access to more of them. But there are some incredible blends out there. So there's one, one of my favorite whiskeys is... Um, by a company called Compass Box. So they're a Glasgow-based um, blender. So they blend whiskies. Um, but they really they put a very modern kind of uh, touch on it and, and they use really, really like high-end whiskies. So they've got like 40-year-old uh, Koila or, or whatever goes into it. But they've got one called This Is Not Luxury Whiskey. And so it's got a bottle that's handwritten in a gold pen that says this is not luxury whiskey, but it's 160 pounds a bottle and it's a blend. Wow. So, and it is, it's, yeah, it's phenomenal. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I wouldn't pigeonhole myself, but yeah, I typically will drink more single malts than blends. However, what I will say to you is we've got another, we've got a, a piece of kit that we, that we sell. It's called an infinity bottle. So what you do is you put all the, so I, when you go to tastings, you get given these little bottles of, you know, like 25 or 50 mil bottles of whiskey and you kind of take them home and you never, it's rare that you, or rare that I go, do you know what I'm going to have, I'm going to drink that little miniature. So, um, so yeah, what, or, or even if you've got bottles of whiskey and you've got like a little bit in the bottom that you're saving and you want to drink it with something special. So what we do is we have an infinity bottle where you pour everything in and you create this, your own blend um and they're yeah they're they're they work out pretty good so if you want to get someone uh something interesting or as a present it's a really good gift well that sounds like a good gift actually um my husband loves whiskey and his favorite is glenmorangie which i think uh, is near your home right yeah so that's that's where i went to school in a, in a town called tain um which is where glenmorangie is from yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, mean, I, I love glenmorangie yeah it's really good really good liquid. So I said we come back to your restaurant in the city. You've got an experience venue there called Smoky Barrels. How does that, yeah. how does that work? So Smoky Barrels is a kind of a competitive socializing, um, virtual hunting uh, kind of experience. So it's basically, um, I don't know, it depends how old everyone is that's watching this, but there's a game, a game on the Nintendo in the 90s called Duck Hunt. And you'd put a little camera on top of your TV and you get this kind of orange and gray pistol and you shoot ducks that fly across. So it's basically duck hunt for adults because we've, we've got a whiskey bar. We've got about 100, 150 whiskeys in the back bar, cocktails, beers. Um, and you get dressed up in some, we've got all this fancy dress, um, tweed jackets and hats. And you basically get dressed up in your, in your, with your mates and you do some shooting. So you can shoot um, pheasants, grouse, deer, We've even got a, we've got a wild haggis hunt as well, so you can shoot haggis. Um, and yes, yeah, it's, it's it's very very uh, competitive and addictive. Right, but well, it sounds like fun. Yeah, and it's in it's in the basement of the restaurant, so it's really fun. So you can go for a slap up meal and then take yourself down for some shooting. Okay. Are you still being waved at? <laughs> um. So, so yeah, so no, but it's been good. So we're, we're going to open up a few more of them. Um, we're opening one in America. Uh, we're supposed to open oh, up wow. two in America. That's good. I'll, I'll come up in a minute. I'll see you once I'm done. Bye. Um, so we've got two smoky barrels opening in America, or we're supposed to have two this year. Um, but I think one's been pushed back till February next year. Right. Um, and yeah, we're looking at other sites site around the UK for that. But it's, yeah. It's a, it's a really really good fun and been well received so brilliant um so you have butcher counters in your restaurants why why do you have that um yeah it's, it kind of opens up a, a new customer base so people can come in and buy their steak to take home and they wanted to even before all this kind of uh, kind of covid thing happened um 
we wanted people to experience Mac and Wild at home and um, and be able to have access to the to the kind of quality of ingredients that we have. So the idea was to have this. Well, I also went full circle a bit to to my old kind of market stall days. Um, so yeah, so we just put the the counters in, and it's actually worked on a kind of a yeah. Uh, on a kind of secondary level where um, at night time people go in and they kind of gather around the butcher counter and they say oh what's that or I want that one oh my god look at that and uh, they might have come in for a burger and chips but they they go, they go out buying a tomahawk and, <laughs> so yes yeah, quite well so it must have been a lifesaver during the covid lockdown um, as your home delivery burger kits and your meat cuts are a massive hit as well Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we very quickly pivoted into this kind of uh, online business and it's something that we had been talking about for a long time. And it's really interesting when you, when you do as a restaurant and we talked about what, you know, who, what, what it is we are and or who we are and what we stand for. And we always like to think we're more than a restaurant, but as soon as you remove your main income uh, revenue stream, like then you really do have to dig deep and say, right, well, actually, like, what are we and how, you know how can we connect with people and what can we what can we do to help and um and luckily we had this you know, we've got excellent supply on tap and um and and suppliers and producers that are still out you know working and they can't you can't just stop you know growing cows or you can't stop the the hunting process that's going on and, and the, the sort of management so so yeah so we and and the supermarkets were bare so we just opened up very quickly opened up a um, an online butcher Fantastic. And, then, and then went into the restaurant kits yeah yeah well they're brilliant and, and I can't wait to use mine um, so how have you managed to keep your teams motivated during lockdown oh man so like my I've worked harder in the last eight weeks or 12 weeks than I've probably ever been I've ever worked before it's it's a yeah, kind of a 7 a.m. Till, till midnight job six or seven days a week or maybe yeah, the weekend I'm trying to a few hours off but um there's so much to do and i think right now it's the the what what's on the line is is has never been tougher and if you know it's the ones that work harder and um and that i have kind of adapted that will succeed um everyone i mean most most people have been furloughed uh we've had a team of about four or five that have been working really hard on the um on the online and it has been, yeah, it has been a challenge, but we've set ourselves some, yeah, some big kind of um, uh, focuses and, and uh, to, to try and achieve. Um, and, and yeah, we've, we've done a really good job, but that's because everyone has been working towards the same goals. And that's, that's the survival of Mac and Wild, basically. So there's, there's quite a lot on the line. So, so do you see the delivery business being as strong once restaurants reopen again? I am certain it won't be as strong, though, and we we can already see a bit of a tailing off in terms of where pe people are going back to the, um, the the supermarkets for their products, and um, and as we've yeah everyone's sort of adapted and got back into the swing of things, and yeah I, I don't think the um, I don't think it'll be quite as strong as it was in the in the crazy days, but it's definitely uh, it's definitely here to stay for Mac and Wild. We we want to really hold on to that, and, and the the future has never been more uncertain so um with the with the limiting space we're going to have and the you know as a, as a restaurant if you're not running at 80 percent capacity you're probably losing money and we're going to need to try and make up some extra revenue elsewhere so the, the at-home kits is great because we can reach instead of just doing you know our london M inside m25 or whoever comes to us we're now reaching every single corner of the uk so there's there's yeah there's potential there when things return to normal, do you think that you'll challenge for Michelin stars? No, Mac and Wild will, will never be a Michelin restaurant. Uh, we're, we're, we're way too much spit and sawdust for that kind of thing. Um, I mean, there yeah, we've got- precedents though. The world famous Michelin starred Noma restaurants in Copenhagen reopened just last month and they're serving only burgers in their garden. Really? Yeah. <laughs> No way. So what? So say that again. So they've they've opened up and they're only serving burgers. Yeah, they're they're serving burgers in their garden and um and and they're world famous for their Michelin stars. Oh well, let's yeah, bring on the. I'll take three then. <laughs> bring it on. Stars, 
I've always had a little bit of a pipe dream about having a Michelin starred restaurant one day. Um, never say the, never. The, yeah, I mean, I would never say never, but um, but yeah, let's let's see. So, we, so what can we expect next from you? What what new things have you got in the pipeline? Oh wow, um, we've got a couple of um, yeah really exciting projects that we're working on right now. Uh, one of them I can't talk about just yet, but that is, um, yeah, yeah, really, really exciting. So I will, I will let you know as and when that opens. But it's okay. Can't um, wait to hear about that. Um, and we're we're working on a new business right now, which is called Restaurant Kits. So with the success of the the Venue Moo, um, we have seen seen that there's this potential, and what I sort of mentioned a minute ago, when when we do open back up uh, the restaurants in in July or whenever that might be, we, we know that we're, it's going to be, a, it's going to be, it's going to be tough and it's going to be a fight and, and we need this extra revenue stream. So, so we start a business where we can take our Mac and wild kit and it's going to be called restaurant kits. So we want to team up with, you know, with good quality restaurants that want to do kits. Um, but when they, when you're, you know, when you're focusing open a restaurant, um, a, you're not going to have the space to dispatch your, whatever your kind of hero dish is. Um, and B, the you're not going to want. It's just, it's just the bandwidth is is not going to be there. So what we're doing is we're taking on this kind of business to promote these kits and and help with the production and kind of acts like a a bit of a a delivery of restaurant kits. So that's launching next week or the week after uh, with ten ten restaurants. Um, so it's pretty cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Um, so so other than your own restaurants, in normal times, where do you love to eat? Um, right. uh, what do you mean doing restaurants? Um, yeah, or do you... is it fine dining or is it burger joints? Right. Um, do you know, I've not been for a fine dining to find a restaurant in a long time. I, I love, I do love it though. I love the, the pretense and the, and the service that you get around it. But, but to be honest, I, I like the more, I like quality foods and well cooked foods more than anything. So Places like I live in South East London, so places like the Camberwell Arms is a big favourite of mine. Um, that's in Camberwell, funnily fun enough, and, and um, uh, Artuzzi is a little Italian place in Peckham. It's amazing. So yeah, they're my, they're my yeah. But just I think just like lo- what I really miss are the local kind of local restaurants. Just going to somewhere local and having a bite to eat and, and coming maybe a beer and then coming home. So is there anything that you won't eat? Oh right. Um anything I won't eat. I've eaten some weird and wonderful things. Um and like I, th- I think when I say things, I, I I don't believe in eating meat that comes from other countries. I try not to eat meat uh, if I don't know where it comes from. But and that's not just saying yeah, where it comes from as in the geographic location. Like I really don't like eating things unless I actually know the farm or the farmer. Right. So that's something I try and stay true to. Um but um but yeah i've i've uh, God, i remember going to a restaurant called Pic- picnic or picnic a little french kind of um chicken restaurant in bermondsey and there was a tasting menu which i just thought was so hilarious or like ironic um they had a, a kind of a chicken tasting menu but they had one they had one bit which the first course was this amazing like chicken liver parfait on some french bread and i was like oh this is insane second course was um a chicken consommé with a little like stick over the top and this person comes up and says this is and they, they picked up my bowl and they picked up my stick and they went this is the art and i was like the what the heart, the heart? and they went, yeah and so they popped it in and there's the heart of the chicken i was like all right wow. cool and this is the this is the peak and it was the you know the bit on top of the chicken the peak yeah and this is the and the next one they went this is the uh what was it the, the gizzard and i was like gizzard the gizzard is amazing and then he says and this is the testicles I was like, what did you say? It's like, testicles, obviously chicken. And I was like, wow. And so I ate all the bits. I left the testicles. But then everyone I was with, they were like, come on. What's that? Did you try them? I did. I did eat them in the end. But, (laughs) you know, I I draw a line somewhere. And I think it's it's just before the testicles and the penis. (laughs) Um... But no, like so. I think I think um, yeah. I I would I will always try 
try anything once, I think. But um, I, I'm not a massive fan of beans. I don't know what it is. Beans and beans and rice. It's the texture. But yeah, it's weird. I think it's only recently I've discovered that. That's really funny you say that because I'm I'm with you on the beans totally. Yeah. yeah I used to hate. I used to hate like them. Yeah, I mean, well. so yeah, that, that's 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 it pretty much. Yeah. So I heard in normal times you're doing bespoke parties. Yeah. So we do um, we do a few events where we'll we'll rock up to people's houses and put on a big kind of theatrical fire pit feast, kind of like I was discussing earlier. And um, yeah, we we do that, and then we can we can do the whole kind of shebang. Yeah. That's the, the catering and the service and things like and that. And you have a Land Rover gun bus. What's that? Yeah, so we've got this huge uh, 1990. So what's that? Is that 30 years old? What was 1990? Yeah, almost 30 years old. Yeah. Oh, no, it is 30 years old. Jesus. And um, uh, so it's a, a 3.2 litre V8 um, engine in it. So it's an absolute beast. Um, but it's a huge. It's a 130. So it's a big, long wheel based Land Rover. Um, and it's just beautiful. Like the engine just sounds amazing, and uh, we try and set our barbecue fire pit feast kind of around it. So it's just it's just a nice backdrop. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, and then we we generally, if it's a small party, we'll invite people into the back of the Land Rover for the first course. So it'll be cocktails and scallops or something like that, and then and, and you know venison tartare. Jump back out of the Land Rover, sit on a nice long table, and have a you know have like four or five courses of everything cooked on the fire it's really cool and we do it we do it in weird and wonderful locations so tops of mountains by the river wow. at, the, at the sea um but yeah really really fun that, that sounds awesome so do you wear a sporran in the kitchen <laughs> you know that was, that was a really funny question because <laughs> i used to and then so i, I take it off and, because I, I wear my kilt quite a lot for cooking or I, well, quite like yeah, for day to day life, I love wearing my kilt. Right. But um, but yeah, the sporin gets in the way. And also, when you put the apron on, it looks, it, it just looks a bit suspect when you've got this big bulge under your apron. And... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah, I keep, uh, yeah, I take the sporin off. Yeah. Okay. I I understand the reason why. So that's fair enough. <laughs> So, Andy, tell me, lastly, tell me something about yourself that I couldn't possibly know. Um, I, I, I'm just not that exciting a person. Um, one, of, one of my biggest achievements, I think, is when I was um, seven, I won a bravery award from the police. I don't know, it was five or seven. I won a bravery award for, um, for catching these two robbers that oh. had... Uh, yeah, they they broken out of prison. Classic story. Broken out of prison, kidnapped a taxi driver, and then um, yeah, they were they were held up in the woods next to where I was from, where I lived. And um, I found them, told the police, and they got caught and put back to prison. And then weirdly, actually, this is I forgot about this. One of the guys they went to prison. One of the guys then became a butcher for my dad, like when I was twenty, and I was I had to work with him. And I, I didn't find out, and I was like, "Holy shit! Like, what this guy's gonna? What's he gonna do?" Did he know you were cool? Uh, I'm not sure. I never really kind of. I didn't want to bring it up in conversation, but he was a really, <laughs> really nice guy, and completely like, yeah, that was a a lifetime ago for him. So, um, but yeah, that, that's it's quite. A, I'm not sure many people know that story. Um. So. On that note, Andy, we've kept you on for, for quite a while. Thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. And, um, and guys, if you want to fan, uh, follow Andy on Instagram, he's on uh, Andy War, Mac and Wild. And I'm at Posh Nosh Girl. Thanks, Andy. Take care and see you Thank soon. You. Bye.